Minister Alex White. Um, thank you, Kahirli. Um, I think this group of amendments that we're dealing with largely, I suppose, there is the most, possibly the most um, contentious, clearly the most contentious aspects of the bill, um, Section 9. And um, I was interested earlier to hear, as I listened very closely um, to him, uh, Deputy Walsh, on the question, and he, he made a point with which I'm fully in agreement. He said, when he was speaking about his own amendments that are included in this group, he said, uh, something, of the, something of the order of, or at least I, hope, I think I'm probably paraphrasing it, but he said that if we omitted suicide, or in other words, we couldn't omit suicide uh, from, from the bill, that if we did so, we would not be acting in accordance with the Constitution. And I think that's true. And the fairness to Deputy Walsh, his, his, his amendments attempt to do some other things without actually fully uh, removing Section 9 or appearing or attempting to remove Section 9, because as he rightly acknowledges, we can't do that. If we're to be true to the Constitution, as interpreted by the Supreme Court in the X case, we can't omit uh, the threat of uh, loss of life arising from suicide. We simply can't do it. We can't have one part of the X case interpretation of the, Supreme Court, of, the, of the Constitution by the Supreme Court. We can't pick and choose. And there's been a lot of debate about the X case and views expressed that it's a flawed judgment. And there was a gratuitous reference by, I can't remember who exactly it was, um, Count Corla, to, and the suggestion that the judgment was manufactured by the Supreme Court. But be that as it may, people have that view. As the point has been made again and again, it is the law. It is our law. It is the interpretation that we have has not been disturbed, has not been varied, has not been reversed, has not in any way uh, been changed by the Supreme Court in all of the 20 years that it has been, uh, that it has been our law and that the judgment has um, obtained. And I, a lot of questions are asked in the course of this debate, and some of them get answered, I suppose, and perhaps some of the questions are asked rhetorically. So I have an opportunity to ask one or two questions in the course of my short contribution, and one of them will be this. Are people seriously suggesting that we ignore the parts of the X case judgment that people don't like? That they say again and again that no problem with Section 7, no problem with Section 8, the problem with Section 9. So that requires them to say that they will pick the parts of the X case judgment that they agree with or are happy with and to ignore or exclude the parts that they don't. Um, with all of the associated uh, uncertainty that would arise from that, at the very minimum a legal vacuum that would obtain, uncertainty for doctors, but most importantly of all, depriving women of a right which they unquestionably have under the Constitution. A right, by the way, Count Corla, even if we were to leave it out of this legislation, they would still have. It just wouldn't be legislated for. There wouldn't be a procedure in place to determine how or in what circumstances it could be exercised, but the right would remain. It would still be there. Because this Oireachtas, although it has many powers, it doesn't have the right to set aside or to jettison a decision of the Supreme Court as to the meaning of an article of the Constitution. We don't have that right. We don't have that entitlement here. That's not our job. We can't rewrite the X case to suit what we would like it to be, or how we would like it to have been decided. We can't decide the case again here. We're not an appeal mechanism from the Supreme Court. That's not what we are here. What we can do is we can go back to the people. If it's believed in the Oireachtas uh, that we should do so, we can go back to the people and invite them to reconsider the matter if there's some doubt as to what the people's true intention was. We can do that. And as we know, we did that twice. And on neither occasion did the people decide to change the relevant clause in their constitution. So if we omit suicide, we will not be acting in accordance with the constitution as interpreted by the Supreme Court. And that's why, for example, one just comes to mind amendment, I think it's 57, in Deputy Keaveney's name. That's why that, that amendment is, frankly, unstatable. And all of the amendments that purport to, to, to extract suicide from the, uh, from the provision are just manifestly 
unstatable as a matter of, uh, as a matter of law and would render what we would do here unconstitutional. And there's no doubt about that. Now, when we talk about what our role is, and again, there's been a lot of debate about this here, and the phrase has been used that we are or we're in danger of towering behind the Supreme Court and the suggestion that it's, it's wrong to say that we're obliged to legislate. So we're not obliged to legislate. There's been a lot of debate about this as to whether we, we were, we're under some sort of a cosh or whether we have to do this. Now, of course we're not under some sort of an edict uh, such that we're, you know, in some way ordered to do something by the Supreme Court and we have to stop up, step up to the plate and do what the Supreme Court orders us to do. Of course that can't occur. And that's not what's actually occurring. The position is very clear. The people enact the Constitution. They amend it as they see fit, as they did in 1983. Where there's a doubt as to the meaning of any provision of the Constitution, as Minister Shatter has, has, uh, has elaborated, the Supreme Court decide that point. And that's clear in the Constitution, Article 34. But the problem is, and it's been a problem in this country, not just in this area, but in many other areas, we can't be requiring the courts uh, to adjudicate on and to address issues of policy. Uh, in fact, arguably, we ought never look to the courts to address issues of policy in the way that we've had far too often, not just in this instance, but in many other instances. It's the other organs of the state, the government, but most particularly the Oireachtas, that have the uh, responsibility to do this. And as I think it was Minister Creighton quoted, Article 15.2.1 uh, of the Constitution, which, which uh, provides that the Oireachtas has the sole and exclusive power of making laws for the state. And that's absolutely true. There's no doubt about that. The problem is when we fail to do it. And that's the difficulty here. We have failed to do it. And if the Oireachtas declines to legislate or fails to legislate as we have, there's no suggestion, this notion that we're saying that there's some kind of a sanction or that we'll be punished in some way, of course that's, that's nonsensical. There's no question of that, of there being a punishment or a sanction as against the Oireachtas or its members for not uh, legislating. But the question should not be, in my respectful view, Count Corla, whether we can get away with not legislating. Because we know we can get away with not doing it. We know that, because we've got away with not legislating for 20 years. The question is, is it right that we should allow the legal position to be and to remain so uncertain as to lead to a state of affairs, as is the case here, where a woman has a constitutional right which she cannot avail of, or at least in respect of which there's a serious doubt as to how it can be availed of and in what circumstances. And of course, when we do legislate, as we're doing here, we're prohibited by Article 15.4 from enacting any law which is in any respect repugnant to this Constitution or any provision thereof. We're subject to the Constitution in that important sense. But we have responsibilities and we have duties. Not that somebody is standing somewhere ready to sanction us in some way, in the absurd way that's been suggested. That's not, but that's not the position. Nobody is suggesting that that's the position. But when we think about what our role is in here as legislators, we have responsibilities and we have duties. We're sent here and we are given duties, important duties, to carry out. The courts have their duties. They're different. The people have their duty as well. And they exercise that in the uh, enactment of a constitution and in the amendment of it or de a decision to amend the constitution or not to do so, as the case may be. But we have to understand our duties in this situation. So as the suggestion of some kind of a compulsion that when we say we're obliged to legislate, that that connotes some sort of a compulsion is, is, is to misrepresent the point that's being made here. We are talking about duties and we're talking about responsibilities and we're talking about the Parliament living up to its responsibilities, which it, failed, which it has failed to do. And far from undermining, as has been suggested, the separation of powers, I, I, I frankly find it very hard to understand how this Parliament doing its duty to legislate 
within the context of the Constitution as, as uh, interpreted by the Supreme Court, that that undermines or risks undermining the separation of powers. The absolute, complete opposite is the case. Far from undermining the separation of powers, acting now and legislating actually upholds the principle of the separation of powers and makes it very clear where the duty lies to legislate, which is here. And then the additional dimension is the, is the broader question of the, of the decision of the European Court of Human Rights. And again, this comes back to this business of have we been pressured, have we been told we have to do something that we don't in reality have to do. I accept that the uh, decision in ABC doesn't enjoin this Eroctus to legislate in any particular way. No, it doesn't. And nobody ever said that it did. What we're required to do as a consequence of, the, of that decision, that European Court of Human Rights decision, is to ensure that there is legal clarity, whatever the law is. Whatever the law is, we decide on what the law is. Not, the, not Europe or the European Court of Human Rights. Nobody ever said that we were doing, uh, that we were, we were uh, um, bringing forward legislation under some sort of diktat from the European Court of Human Rights. Nobody said that. And it isn't so. What we did say was that the European Court of, rights, uh, Court of Human Rights decision in ABC, particularly in relation to Ms. C, was that there should be legal clarity. We, it was up to us to decide on what the law should be, but that there should be a law. That there should be a law. And then when we look to see what that law should be, we have to have regard to our Constitution and to the interpretation of our Constitution by the Supreme Court. So it's not a question of, again, compulsion or being ordered to do things. It's a question of very clear, delineated roles and duties and responsibilities, and we have to face up to them and we have to carry them out. Now, Minister Shatter has, has addressed a number of the issues, and I know it's, it's a late hour, although with all, all the discussion about, you know, extending the debate to five o'clock, it may hopefully won't come as a surprise to members of the public that we are capable of exercising our brains after midnight, Cian Corla, and I think that we can to continue to debate this issue um, uh, uh, as we're required to do. But can I just briefly touch on the the, 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 the uh, reference to the uh, retired judge uh, O'Flaherty's point, um, which I, I found, like Minister Shatter, somewhat bizarre, certainly quite inexplicable to me, that it could be suggested that because Miss X did not ultimately have a termination, that that somehow cast doubt on whether she had engaged the right that had been uh, found in the Supreme Court that she had. I, I just find that very, very difficult to understand as a matter of law, that if the court determines that somebody has a right, but they don't ultimately avail of that right, that that means they didn't have the right. That would need to be explained, because that is not at all, uh, not at all clear to me how that could possibly, how that could possibly so, be so. I have to say with respect also that, and again, Minister Shatter has dealt with this question of um, uh, uh, what constitutes the, the, the ratio of a case, what constitutes the, the, the core of the case in, um, in, 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 in X, and the suggestion, that, um, the suggestion that the finding of an entitlement to a termination in the X case was arbitrary. That, I have to say, with great respect and genuine respect, is an unstatable and unsustainable argument. Because if, if anybody, and there was talk of first-year law students and everything else, if anybody was to just take a cursory look, even, let alone go into it in the sort of detail that you would expect people to do, to suggest that the finding, after all of the argument her, um, um, uh, gone through by Chief Justice Finlay on that occasion, his, his re uh, reciting of the decision in the High Court, his reciting of other decisions which are relevant to, uh, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the finding, and then him coming to the conclusion, and I quote, it's been quoted earlier, but I think it's important to quote it again, quote, I am therefore satisfied that on the evidence before the learned trial judge, which was in no way contested, and on, the findings, uh, and on the findings which he has made, 
that the defendants' appellants have satisfied the test which I have laid down as being appropriate and have established as a matter of probability that there is a real and substantial risk to the life of the mother by self-destruction which can only be avoided by termination of her pregnancy. I, I can't see how that could conceivably be regarded as arbiter. And no one could suggest that uh, credibly, that this is a sort of a beside the point or something that wasn't relevant to the decision. It manifestly is the decision. It is the decision. And I think it might be worthwhile, Count Corla, if I may, because there's been a lot of reference to Ms. X and to the case itself and to the circumstances of the case. I would like, if I may, to uh, read into the record of this debate what Chief Justice Finley went on to say then in this particular case, because it relates to the facts. So he sets down the test, the actual test that has to be passed, that has to be applied and has to be satisfied. And then he asks this question, and I'm just quoting now directly from the judgment. Has the appellant by evidence satisfied this test? With regard to this issue, the findings of fact made by the learned trial judge in the High Court are as follows. When the defendant learned she, that she was pregnant, she naturally was greatly distraught and upset. Later, she confided in her mother that when she learned she was pregnant, she had wanted to kill herself by throwing herself downstairs. On the journey back from London, she told her mother that she had so much trouble, she would rather be dead than continue as she was. On the 31st of January, in the course of a long discussion with a member of the Garda Sheikh Khan, she said, quote, I wish it were all over. Sometimes I feel like throwing myself downstairs, unquote. And in the presence of another member of the Garda Sheikh Khanna, when her father commented that, quote, the situation was worse than a death in the family, unquote, she commented, this is X, quote, not if it was me, unquote. On the day of her return from London, the defendant's parents brought her to a very experienced clinical psychologist. He explained in his report that he had been asked to assess her emotional state that whilst she was cooperative, she was emotionally withdrawn, that he had concluded that she was in a state of shock and that she had lost touch with her feelings. She told him that she had been crying on her own, but had hidden her feelings from her parents to protect them. His opinion was that her vacant, expressionless manner indicated that she was coping with the appalling crisis she faced by a denial of her emotions. She did not seem depressed, but he said that she, quote, coldly expressed a desire to solve matters by ending her life, unquote. In his opinion, in her withdrawn state, quote, she was capable of such an act, not so much because she's depressed, but because, but because she could calculatingly reach the conclusion that death is the best solution, unquote. He considered that the psychological damage to her of carrying a child would be considerable and that the damage to her mental health would be devastating. His report was supplemented by oral testimony. He explained in the course of his consultation with the defendant that she had said to him, quote, it is hard at 14 to go through the nine months, unquote, and that she said, quote, it is better to end it now than in nine months' time, unquote. The psychologist underst understood this to mean that by ending her life, she would end the problems through which she was putting her parents, with whom she has a very strong and loving relationship. The psychologist who gave oral evidence as well as submitting a report, which was admitted by agreement in evidence before the learned trial judge in the High Court, stated that when he interviewed this young girl and was anxious to have a continuing discussion with her parents who accompanied her, and not having anybody available to remain with, not having anybody available to remain with the young girl in the waiting room, his view of the risk of her committing suicide was so real on his past experience in this field of medicine that notwithstanding its obvious inappropriateness, he requested her to remain in the room while he discussed the problem with her parents. And it goes back to, 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 to the judge. I am satisfied that the only risk put forward in this case to the life of the mother is the risk of self-destruction. I agree with the conclusion reached by the learned trial judge in the High Court that that was a risk which, as would be appropriate in any other form of risk to the life of the mother, must be taken into account in reconciling the right of the unborn to life and the rights of the mother to life. Such a risk to the life of a young mother in particular has, it seems to me, a particular characteristic 
which is relevant to the question of whether the evidence in this case justifies a conclusion that it constitutes a real and substantial risk of life. If a physical condition emanating from a pregnancy occurs in a mother, it may be that a decision to terminate the pregnancy in order to save her life can be postponed for a significant period in order to monitor the progress of the physical condition, and that there are diagnostic warning signs which can readily be relied upon during such postponement. It's in a physical case. In my view, it is common sense that a threat of self-destruction, such as is outlined in the evidence in this case, which the psychologist clearly believes to be a very real threat, cannot be monitored in that sense, and that it is almost impossible to prevent self-destruction in a young girl in the situation in which this defendant is if she were to decide to carry out her threat of suicide. I am therefore satisfied that on the evidence before the learner trial judge, repeating this bit, it's just coming to an end, which was in no way contested, and on the findings which he has made, that the defendant's appellants have satisfied the test which I have laid down as being appropriate and have established as a matter of probability that there is a real and substantial risk to the life of the mother by self-destruction, which can only be avoided by termination of her pregnancy. And that's why the defendants were entitled to succeed in the appeal from the High Court to the Supreme Court. Now, Can Carlo, whatever anybody may think about the X case judgment, no one can suggest that it was uh, 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 that it was, it, it, would, it was decided without regard uh, both to the humanity of the uh, circumstances that were presented to the court or to the terms of the Constitution and the requirement to balance the uh, right to life of the unborn, not to balance, but to have, uh, both in, in, to, to have in mind both the right to life of the unborn with due regard to the equal right to life of the mother. That is not a passage uh, from a, a, a decision of a court that appears to, would, would appear to any reasonable person to have been lightly decided or lightly arrived at. And that's why I object to the suggestion made in this chamber that the judgment was in some way manufactured. I think that, was, that, was, that's a, that, that is an unfair way of characterizing this judgment and I put, I, I put that, I think, at its mildest. It is far from being a, a judgment that uh, is, is that where the issues were taken lightly, either legal, the legal issues or indeed the, the factual issues. And the, there were a number of, uh, I think, the, the Cosmic case went dealt with my colleague. Can I just briefly say in relation to the Attorney General and Ryan's car hire, and the reason why I raise this, or just to touch on this, is that it's been suggested that um, and I think it was, it was Ms. Cahill, Maria Cahill, who made this point in the, um, which was quoted by Minister Creighton earlier. It was Ms. Cahill who raised these issues in the hearings before the Health Committee. And may I just say, Count Corla, since it occurs to me, the constant su suggestion that because um, minister, the Minister for Health, or I, or I'm Deputy Lynch, or Minister Lynch was there for some time, I was there for some time, and Minister uh, Riley was there at the outset. And it's such a small point, but it's just because it occurs to me now. The suggestion that ministers weren't sitting through all of the hearings at the, at the committee, that therefore we didn't know what occurred there, or we, di we didn't take our time to look at what happened there, or to read the transcripts of it, or, or at least when we were available to observe it um, on the screen, I find that really unacceptable, really unacceptable. Because I know from having discussed this issue with both my colleague ministers in the Department of Health that there's a, there was a full awareness of what was said at the committee. I myself went through the, the, the transcripts as best I could and informed myself as what was said, said at the committee. And I know that Ms. Cahill raised these issues about uh, um, Cosma and the Minister of Justice and AG and Ryan's car, uh, car hire because I did look at the transcript. And I'm not looking for any particular congratulations on that. That's just a job that we do. But don't be suggesting that because we weren't there. I mean, how many, there's a good few members in here, but we don't we know that there are colleagues who are able to watch and observe this debate without necessarily being in the chamber. And the same is true of the committee. Now, the point about AG and Ryan's car hire is that is, is, was suggested by Ms. Cattle um, that because of the, the, the well-known decision of uh, Mr. Justice Kingsman Moore in that case, that in circumstances where um, uh, matters were overlooked, uh, uh, um, uh, matters were overlooked, um, that in those circumstances um, where no legal submissions, as Ms. Cattle said to the committee, no legal submissions were heard, she said this. 
She said, because there were no legal submissions heard on whether suicidal ideation could validly satisfy the test in X, that we couldn't rely on the judgment. Now, the, the point, of course, was conceded by the Attorney General in X. The point being that uh, suicidal ideation could validly satisfy the test in X. Suicidal ideation could constitute a risk of loss of life. That's all that is. Not that it did in that case, but that it could. How could it not be conceded by the Attorney General? How could it not be the case? Would anybody explain to me? How could it conceivably not be the case that uh, uh, that's the, a risk of suicide is a risk of loss of life? Is a risk of suicide a risk of loss of life? Well, manifestly it is. So, of course, it was conceded by the Attorney General. Why would there need to be arguments made to any court that the risk of loss of life includes a risk of suicide? That is just a plain, uncontrovertible, undeniable fact that couldn't, be, couldn't possibly not be conceded by the Attorney General. Uh, unless anybody here is seriously arguing that if, if a person is at risk of death, death from suicide, that they're not, a risk of, they're not at risk of death. I mean, this, this, so this argument really does it, it, it sometimes get, gets extended to a really absurd level. Because quite clearly, a risk of death from suicide is a risk of death. And that's what was conceded. And it's not an absurd premise at all. It's an absolutely undeniable one. So that's why I, I have to say, Count Corla, that it doesn't seem to me to be remotely statable that uh, the X case is to be set aside in some way because of uh, anything that was found in AG and Ryan's car. Um, I'm struck by the number of times that the issue of honesty is raised in this debate. And Deputy Shortall did it earlier on. Deputy Keaveney did it. People's motivations are questioned. People's, whether people have a conscience or not. Conscience is seems to be something that, in some people's minds, only exists on one side of the argument. But I do find it, I do find it really, after all, I'm sure all members of this House on both sides of the argument would, 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 I would imagine would agree with me, that when people approach this debate from whatever perspective, that they do so honestly. And I think we all owe each other that, at least, that we don't attribute dishonesty to each other in the manner in which uh, we approach this uh, difficult issue. Well, Deputy Shortall said that uh, it would have been more honest, she said, for the government to legislate for termination in cases of fatal fetal abnormalities, and she mentioned rape and incest, than to do what we're doing. Now, of course, it isn't possible for the reasons that were clearly set out by Minister Shatter, and which we've had in this debate over and over again. Wouldn't be possible under the Constitution for us to do that. And by the way, Deputy Daly's bills didn't do that. And I find it, you know, extraordinary that, again, when we come back to the honesty issue, that we're attacked for doing something that everybody knows we can't do. And in circumstances where others, and I always thought Deputy Daly, but I, I welcome Deputy Daly's intervention in this. I was one, I, colleagues in, on this side were looking at me askance when I actually said that I thought that, that, was, that Deputy Daly bringing forward a bill was a, was a very uh, honest, if I may say so, intervention at the time in circumstances where we did not accept her bill, we didn't think it was, we didn't think it was adequate, we thought there were problems with it, and we said we would do this ourselves, which is what we've done. But to then come back a few months later and to throw at us a question as to why we haven't done things that, she did, that Deputy Daly didn't do in her bill. Now, she, the reason why Deputy Daly, Daly didn't put them into her bill, don't criticise her for it, is because she couldn't put it into the bill, these additional circumstances. She couldn't do it, which, for the exact same reason that we can't do it. Because she looked at the Constitution when she was drafting her bill, as you would expect her to do, which is what we did. So it's no different on either side 
when, 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 uh, and, and it's, it's just simply, and I have to say, and I, I really hesitate to make this point, but the, the notion that, you know, we're dishonest in some way about this, or disingenuous, I reject out of hand. I reject out of hand. As Minister Shatter said towards the, close, towards the end of his, of his contribution, that we are carefully advised by, and expertly advised by the Attorney General. We understand the implications of the Constitution and the importance of upholding the terms of the Constitution in anything we do. And we have different views. I happen to share the view that, um, that you know, the, the Constitution is, uh, it, it, well, you know, that there are circumstances where, of course, um, the Irish people may well consider that they want to revisit Article 43.3. And they could do that in a referendum. But don't try to persuade this House or persuade the people that it can be done simply by putting it down on a piece of paper and telling the government that they're dishonest for not doing it. I find that disingenuous. That is disingenuous. Let's all be honest with each other and not ascribe uh, dishonesty uh, to, 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 to others when it's quite clear what the position actually, uh, actually is. On the question of, I'm not going to go back into these again because they were dealt with, and I'm sorry, it was suggested that we didn't deal at committee stage with the question of the implication for doctors and so on, uh, where doctors might be, you know, there might be a legal liability associated with, associated with doctors acting in particular. We did deal with that at committee stage. We dealt with it carefully at, at committee stage, where we said that as, the, that, uh, as best we could describe the, the, the law, if, the, if doctors and medical practitioners act within the law, and act within the scope of what's in the bill, that, that, um, that, 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 that there would not be a liability as, attaching to them. But we know that overall there's a, there's a general legal context as well in respect of what the requirements on doctors are and what the standards of their uh, profession are. And there are well-known principles of, med uh, of medical negligence uh, which doctors understand and which uh, they would uh, obviously have to uphold. And just finally on the question of gestational gestational limits. The test is whether there's a real and substantial risk to the life of the mother that can only be averted by the termination. Now, are people saying, when they want to set a certain gestation, well, they must be saying this, when they want to set a gestation limit, let's, let's pick a certain, a certain limit, let's say it's 22 weeks. Let's say that's the gestation limit that people will come up with, whatever it is. The clear and plain implications of what they're proposing is that the test of a real and substantial risk to the life of the mother that can only be averted through termination disappears when you go beyond that limit. So that test is gone. Because it gives, it has, the test has to give way. And that is not the law. That is not what the Supreme Court said. That's not what the Constitution means. It doesn't. You, the test is whether there's a real and substantial risk can only be averted by termination. And that test is the test at all stages. That is the position. That's, that's, that's what's been found. So again, there's a question, there needs to be a question of honesty here, and people need to understand uh, what the actual position is. And some people do understand it, but perhaps want to argue, um, that, uh, want to argue otherwise. Thank you, Kim. Uh, Deputy John